All right. Well, I really appreciate Pastor Kevin giving me this opportunity. I wasn't expecting it, uh, but I really appreciate it. Can you guys hear me okay? Do I need to speak up? Okay. All right. So, obviously, from Mark 16, we're going to be talking about snake handling. Uh, just, kidding. just kidding. We're not talking about Mark snake handling. Okay. So, the... The title of my sermon today is called Being a Consistent Soul Winner, okay? I just want to encourage you guys, because I know this area right now is a little bit harder, and I've come from an area in Arizona that is similar to this, so I want to encourage you guys with a good sermon. So the verse I want to focus on is uh, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, of course, and it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. And let's just open with a word of prayer first. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity. I pray that you would... Bless the people here who have come to hear your word. I pray that you'd help me as I preach, that it would be clear, and uh, that it would just be helpful to those listening. And just bless us, Lord. And in Jesus' name, amen. All right. So this is going to be an alliterated sermon. I, I didn't think I could do it, but it is. It's all P's. Okay? So the first one is the precept. And that's what we just read in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, that God is commanding us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Okay? Now... Does that mean that all of us have to just pack up, pick up, pack up all our stuff and just like move to the other side of the world? Is that what he's saying that we have to do? Uh, I would say no. Uh, first of all, some of you, it's, it's not even possible, right? I mean, it would probably be kind of hard to just, you know, if you have no money, to just move to the other side of the world, okay? So what he's saying is, look, wherever you are in the world, you need to preach the gospel to every creature, okay? Now, so some of us are going to stay where we were born, all right? I, probably some people were born here, even in, in this area. And some of us go to other parts of the world. Some of us, like my wife and my baby and I, we travel, you know, everywhere. And everywhere we go, we try to preach the gospel to people. So that's, that's the command, that's the precept that God has for us, is that wherever we are, we preach the gospel, okay? Now, why is it that he gives us this, this command, right? So... What is the problem that he's solving with this precept that he's given us? Turn over to Matthew chapter 9 with me, and we'll look at verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. And it says there, Jesus uh, is going to be talking here. He says, well, he's not talking yet, but it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd." So Jesus is there, he's, he's in Israel, right? And he sees these multitudes of people. Now, I don't want us to think that this is all we have to think about this verse. We can think of Jesus in heaven looking on the whole world at the multitudes of people without Jesus, right? He's seeing them. And does he say like, man, look at those people. They're not believing in me. They can all just go to hell. Is that what he says? No, it says here he was moved with compassion on them because they were as sheep having no shepherd, okay? So they need that shepherd, Christ, right, so that they can go to heaven. And so we also ought to have compassion on people. And, I, I mean, sometimes we go out soul winning, especially when people have not been paying attention to us. They're closing the door in our faces. And we get the idea that, you know, nobody's going to listen. Ah, just let them go to hell, whatever. We need to first have compassion on people, right? Think about what state they're in and where they're going to go when they die, right? Now, keep reading in verse 37. It says, then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Okay. So we have multitudes without God, but yet there are, are few laborers. Right. Now, before I get into the part about few laborers, it does not say that there are no laborers. So we shouldn't get this idea that we're like this one and only group of people out there. We're the only people preaching the gospel. Nobody else is. We're just doing great things for God and everyone else is a loser, right? We don't want to get that attitude of pride, okay? We have to be humble and recognize that there are laborers. There's just few of them, okay? So about being the few laborers, though, since there are few, then we need to step up. If we have that ability, we can step up and preach the gospel to the people around us, okay? But not to be proud in doing it, right? Now, so we have the precept. We go and preach the gospel. Why are we preaching the gospel? Because there are multitudes. I mean, multitudes of people that are not saved. However, we got to have the right perspective, okay? And turn over with me to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. 
So the multitudes without God, few laborers, we're going to get out there and labor, but let's do it with the right perspective. Okay, Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. I'm sorry, I, I, I think see that. Matthew 7, verse 13, it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Okay, now, this is a very sobering verse, of course, because it's saying that more than 50% of the people are going to go to hell. That's pretty sobering. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that our perspective should not be that we're imagining ourselves as these people who are just going to save the whole world. Okay? We shouldn't think that we are going to reach that. It's an unattainable goal. Okay? We need to have an attainable goal. It's few people that will be saved. Okay? Don't think, there are some Christians who actually believe that the whole world is going to be Christianized and then Jesus is coming back. That is ridiculous and it's never going to happen, right? Never going to happen. So let's have the right perspective. Few people will be saved, uh, but yet we still need to go out and preach the gospel for those few who will be saved. Now, so we talked about, what, the precept, right? Going out and preaching the gospel. I'm going to keep reviewing this over and over, right? You're going to remember every point by the time I'm done, okay? So the precept, preaching the gospel. The problem is that there are multitudes without God, and there's few laborers, right? But have a realistic perspective that only few will be saved, okay? Now, why do we go out so late, okay? We should desire the promises that God has for us, okay? First, go over to Psalm chapter 126. Starting in verse 5, Psalm 126, starting in verse 5. It says there, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, notice it says there, we have to go out with the right attitude. He talks about weeping, right? You're going forth and you're weeping, Bearing the precious seed. Of course, what's more precious to the seed than the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, right? So when we go forth and weep, I, you know, I'm not saying that you're necessarily, you know, crying at the door, people's door, like you're crying in front of them. Oh, you got to receive the gospel, man. You're going to go to hell, right? But you go with the right attitude. And that attitude is the compassion that Christ had upon those people when he originally said he was moved with compassion, okay? So you're bearing the precious seed, you're preaching the gospel, and what is the promise? It says, you shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. Okay. Now, does it say sheaf or sheaves? It says sheaves, doesn't it? So it's not like you're just going to get one person saved in your whole time still winning, right? You're going to have multiple people saved. And that's a good promise of God, right? So your time is not wasted uh, in just... So, so, for example, there are people who just spend their whole life as missionaries and they focus on like one person. You know, months and months, we're trying to get this family saved, right? Look, you can have sheaves, right? You can have sheaves. Focus on more than just one individual person. Get it out to a lot of people, bearing the precious seed out to many people, okay? Now, let's look at another promise that he has for us. So we will reap. It's without a doubt that we will reap. Go to Proverbs chapter 11 and put a finger there and also turn over to John chapter 4. So Proverbs 11, verse 30, and John chapter 4, uh, verses 35 to 38. So starting in Proverbs 11, it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. And if you're in John chapter 4, starting in verse 35, it says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth, receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Now if we compare these, right? In Proverbs chapter 11, he says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And in John chapter 4, uh, I think it's verse 36, he says, or yeah, verse 36, and he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. 
So God is promising us, look, those people that you're getting saved, right? And I think we know this already. If, if we're saved, we should know this. They have everlasting life, right? You'll see that person again. There's no doubt about it. You're going to see that person again in heaven. And look at this. When you reap, he says, you receive wages. Okay? Now, those wages may be things on this earth that God blesses us with that we might not otherwise have had. Okay? I personally believe if I'd never started soul winning, I would have never met my wife. Okay? Because it was only after that that I was able to even meet her, even though I had tried before. It didn't work out until later. So, and of course in heaven, God has wages for us, right? He's going to reward us according to our works. Now, also think about this, right? I don't know how you guys are with your family, your extended family, right? But when I was growing up, we always went out every year, and we would meet with our cousins and our uncles and aunts and everything. And it was so great to just catch up and talk with them and see what's going on and play games and everything. Just think about we as the family of God, right? We can grow that family through soul winning, right? We bring more people into that family. And those people are like kind of like our children in a way, right? So one day when you go to heaven, right, you're going to meet all these people that you personally reaped, right? You're going to gather with them. You're going to be able to talk with them. But then think about this verse right here. It also says, one soweth and another reapeth. Think about all the people you've talked to that didn't get saved right there, right? You're sowing that seed, but did they get saved right then and there? Were you reaping them right then? No, you weren't. But there are many of those people that will be reaped by somebody else. And you're gonna meet with them later on and you're gonna get to hear all of these awesome stories about, whoa, you know, what happened? You know, how did you finally get saved? Like you, you slammed the door in my face after I gave you one verse and then what are you doing here, you know? It's not going to be great to just like, I mean, that's just a reward. And I, I feel like that's a reward just from the family perspective of just talking with people. I think it's going to be great. So we have, we got a review. Hold on, guys. We got the precept. You got to preach the gospel, okay? You have to preach the gospel. You have to recognize why you're preaching the gospel because there are multitudes that are dying without Christ. Have compassion on them. And there are a few of us that are going out. So let's make it to more people and go out, okay? And realize, though, that few of them will be saved. Don't get a wrong perspective on, oh, man, I'm going to just get saved the whole caloundra, you know. It's not going to happen. Okay. Desire the promises that you're going to reap. You will come back with people being saved. And you will have reward later on in heaven and even on this earth. Now, so we have this great work set out for us, but how do we prepare for the work? Okay, what do we do to prepare for the work? Well, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And I'm going to read over three different passages. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, where it says, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Okay? And turn over also to Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Acts chapter 4, verse, and you can, keep, you can keep fingers in these places, or just listen, whatever floats your boat. Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, which says, Oh man, I gotta, I gotta get loud now, guys, okay? All right, Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now that, that was a great testimony of Jesus right there. And look what it says next. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. Okay? And the last passage on this is John chapter 15. Verses 4 and 5, John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. It says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now, the commonality between all these passages, I think, is we see it says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It says they had been, it, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And Jesus says, for without me, ye can do nothing. 
right? So what is the key, one key thing we have to be doing? We have to be following Christ, right? We can't be walking in our flesh, just live in the world, you know, and think that we're going to go out and actually be able to win people to Christ, right? We can't live like that. We have to follow Christ. And following Christ, I mean, is he standing here? Can we just like walk around with him like the disciples did in, in Galilee and Nazareth and everything? We can't do that, right? However, we can read the Bible, right? We follow him along when we read our Bible. We follow behind him and see what did he do? What did he say? What is it that he wants us to do, right? So that's how we do it. We read his word, and we don't just read it. We don't want to be forgetful hearers, but we have to be doers of the word, right? We have to obey what he said, or we will become forgetful hearers. I don't know why there's an echo, but uh, anyways. So reading and obeying is what's important. Now, the second important thing for preparing for this work may seem kind of obvious, but let's just read it anyways. In, in Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, in verse 16, it says, It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So if we're going to be prepared for the work, we have to recognize that we cannot be ashamed of the gospel. If you're ashamed of the gospel, are you going to tell people about it? You're not going to tell them, right? So you have to be certain that this is the truth, right? There's no other way. It has to be exclusive in your mind, right? We can't just think, oh, well, you know, I'm going to just live my life and I'm going to dress up with my necktie and everybody's going to recognize that you know, I'm a Christian and they're going to come up and ask me, hey, what must I do to be saved, right? That's not going to happen. I've never had it. Has anybody ever had it happen? No? Nope. Nobody? No? Okay. Yeah. I don't think that happens. So it's not lifestyle evangelism that's going to help, right? You have to be unashamed of the gospel and be willing to open your mouth and tell people. Now, it's so exclusive that if they don't believe it, then they're going to hell, right? You have to be willing to tell people, look, if you don't believe, hell is the destination, right? Because your sins have reached into heaven, right? I mean, God is against you because you're a sinner, right? You have to have his son to save you. So you, you, in order to prepare for the work, you've got to follow Christ, reading and obeying his words, and you have to not be ashamed of the gospel, okay? Very, very important points. So reviewing really quick, preach the gospel, right? That's the precept. The problem is that there are multitudes without God. We have to have compassion on them. Compassion, right? We can't go out there in our flesh. We have to actually have compassion on people. And that there are few laborers, so let's go out and add to the laborers. And yet not everybody's going to get saved. That's the perspective we have to have. Not everyone will get saved. Don't be disappointed when people close the door. You know, it's, it's not a problem. That person may get saved later, but don't, don't sweat it, right? Desire the promises that, hey, we will reap. Let's just go out and do the work. We are going to reap it sometime. God promised it, okay? And that we will receive wages, whether it be in this life or in the life to come. And we'll gather with those people that we see, uh, that we see saved here on this earth. Follow Christ in preparing for his work. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Now, you can prepare all you want, right? But you cannot go there just in your flesh, right? So how do you know if you're not going to be going out there in your flesh? Well, the next point is that you're praying for help. Okay, you got to pray. You have to pray. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. It says here, Paul is speaking, he says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Right? Now, who's speaking here? It's Paul, right? Now, do you guys think that Paul was just like, really good at giving the gospel. I'm sure he was excellent. He could give it many different ways, I'm sure, and give so many examples and explanations. But guess what? He couldn't do it in his own flesh. He's saying, look, guys, I need your prayers because 
I need utterance as well. You have to be able to open your mouth and you have to be able to have boldness, okay? And the way he's asking to get that is not, he's not, you know, just like thinking like, oh, I gotta psych myself up, you know? Just think about all those people who are gonna slam the door and get angry. That's not, that's not, that's all the flesh, right? You're not, you're not thinking about being angry and trying to make yourself up enough to preach the gospel. You have to pray, right? Because you need compassion on those people. You can't be angry when you're preaching the gospel. You have to have compassion. So we pray for utterance. And of course, who is it that controls man's mouth? I think Moses found that out, right? God told him, hey, I made your mouth. I can give you the words to speak to Pharaoh, right? So we, of course, would pray to God for the utterance to be given unto us. And if Paul needs it, how much more do we need it, right? So, and he also says there, he opens his mouth boldly, because preaching the gospel requires boldness, right? I mean, it, it just takes boldness, right? Now, now, the next point is, how exactly do we get the utterance and the boldness? What exactly are we praying for? Go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. It says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. So what is it that allowed them to speak with boldness? It was the filling of the Holy Spirit, wasn't it? So we have to be filled with spirit. We have to pray for the filling of the spirit in order to preach the word of God with boldness, to be able to go out and do that. So all of that seems maybe simple, but we forget about it. I mean, how many times do we go out so winning and it's like, oh yeah, let's pray right before we go. You know, we haven't even thought about it all week long. Like, oh, I, I should pray about my soul winning coming up. It's like, we're literally out the door of the car and it's like, oh yeah, let's pray. Okay, dear Lord, please be with us, right? We, we got to think about it earlier, and I'm at fault as much as anybody, right? I, I often forget to do that. One of our esteemed but fallen pastors in America used to say, you know, you should pray a week before you're planning on going out. You should be already praying for the people that God knows you're going to meet, you know, and be praying that they would be ready to hear and that you would be ready to speak as well. And I think that was good advice. Too bad he didn't take it. So the next point is... What about preaching the message? So we gotta pray, but then we actually have to preach the message. So how do we do that? And I'm not gonna give you like a point by point of soul winning, okay? This is just like <laughs> some principles, okay? Uh, we'll be here for a while if we do that. First Corinthians chapter two, first Corinthians chapter two, verses one through five. First Corinthians chapter two, verses one through five. It says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, a lot of people will take this verse and try to use it and say, man, we've only got to preach about the gospel every week, right? That's, that's not the point. Paul's saying, look, when I first came to you, you Corinthians, you weren't saved. And I didn't come up to you and, and start railing on your fornicating, even though you guys are terrible fornicators, apparently. And I didn't rail on everything else you were doing. Instead, I preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. So we don't walk up to people's doors and start just condemning everything they're doing, and oh, you're dressed wrong, whatever. We don't come up there with also philosophies, okay? We wanna come up there with the gospel, right? Our goal is not just to say, hey, you know, this is a proof of how God exists, right? That, I'm proving this to you right now, right? Now, could some of those things be helpful? They might be helpful, but that is not our goal. We're not out there debating, like a lot of these people on YouTube who go out and like to just debate people, right, and try to prove their points. We are using the gospel, which, as Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, is the power of God unto salvation. It's not my philosophy and my ideas of, 
of how God is, exactly like that, that is going to get somebody saved. Okay? So just preach the gospel simply. It's the simplicity that is in Christ that's going to make the difference. Okay? Now, we often hear, you know, we have a lot of people who will let you give one verse or something like that. But we also have rejection, you know, after that. You might get one verse, but then they're like, okay, see you, bye. Or I think the other day we had one who just was like, open the door, saw like, I don't know, the thing about heaven, and it's like, close the door, okay? No yelling, but so how do we deal with rejection, right? Because the thing about rejection is that we often think, ah, oh, they're rejecting me. Man, I'm so upset now. I'm, I'm quitting, right? That's what we often think. But see, that's not going to help you be a consistent soul winner if you think like that, right? Whenever that happens, remember you went to that door with compassion, right? Right? Compassion, okay? Not thinking that it's our own power. We went there thinking, hey, man, this is a lost sheep here. He's just scattered abroad, and we got to bring him to the shepherd, okay? But he's not coming yet, right? He's still eating grass over here in the world, right? He doesn't want to come. So we have to think of it that way uh, and not just be all upset whenever people just reject us, okay? And just, you know, it probably is a good idea to actually, maybe as you're turning around, walking away, just pray that somebody else will be able to reach that person. Maybe it wasn't you, right? And also consider this. You know, sometimes when people reject, it's, it's not always even you, right? Maybe they just had a crazy phone call about something really bad that just happened or some of the reason they just don't want to talk to you right now, right? Who knows the reason? And that's where we get into what about rebuking people? Is there ever a time to rebuke somebody when you're out soul winning? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verses 5 through 11. Acts chapter 18. It's a little bit longer passage, but I think it's important to read this. Acts chapter 18, verses 5 through 11. It says, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God. So Paul was pressed in the spirit originally to go and speak to these Jews, right? And yet what did they do? They just were just against him and they blasphemed God, right? And did Paul just let that go? Was he like, oh, don't worry about it, guys. Go in peace. God bless you. You know, he didn't do that, right? There is a time in which you have to rebuke somebody. Now, I'm not saying you just, you know, say the most mean thing you could possibly say to them, but you have to tell them the truth, right? And he said, look, your blood be upon your own heads, right? You can tell people, look, if you don't believe, you're going to hell, you know? You can reject it, but your destination right now is on the way to hell, right? See you. You know, just leave it at that. And what happens when he left? Was that the end of it? You know, was there no success in that area? No, it says he went right next door to a guy who worshiped God. And guess what? It was next to the synagogue. And what happened to the chief ruler of the synagogue? <clears throat> he was kind of like secretly going in there probably. He's like, hey, what is this guy really teaching? You know? And what happens? It says that Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So all the other Jews are like, we don't like Jesus, you know, curse Jesus. But then the chief ruler himself actually got saved. You know, so just remember that when you rebuke somebody, it, don't let it be in the flesh. You know, it can't be in the flesh. You got to do it according to the word of God. You know, we use the word of God to rebuke them, not just cuss them out or something. That's not how we do it, uh, because then probably the rest of your soul winning is going to be ruined. But if you do it according to God's word, look right next door. There's probably going to be a guy that's going to listen to you, right? You're going to get him saved. Not a promise, but it's very possible. Now. Uh, let me just give this one example uh, for some of you, it, my own experience of something I did one time that I got rebuked for, okay, in my own flesh, okay. Now, this was up in Prescott Valley, Arizona, and I was soul winning with uh, my friend Sebastian up there, 
and it was Easter. And you would think that would be a time where you're thinking about Jesus and you're in the spirit, right? I wasn't, in, I wasn't following my own preaching here, okay? And when people would close the door, not even just slam the doors like, oh, I'm not interested, so you, you know, close the door. I would say, oh, and a happy Easter to you too, you know? Which is like just whatever, you know, so much for your Easter. You don't, you don't get Easter, huh? Because you're not even saved. Instead of saying, hey, happy Easter when they open the door, it was happy Easter to you. And my friend rebuked me for it. You know, Sebastian, he was thinking about it. He was looking at me. He's like, what is this guy doing? Man, he's just like making the cause of Christ look bad to these people. And I'm really glad he rebuked me. And, and uh, I, I repented right there and stopped doing it. And I was just thankful for that. So just don't do things like that, especially if you're, you know, being sarcastic about maybe them going to heaven or something like that. Well, I guess you won't go to heaven. You know, don't say stuff like that to people. You know, that's when you're being sarcastic just because they close the door on you, you know. Again, the false prophet, people like that, blaspheming Jesus, that's different, right? Rebuke them with the word of God, okay? Now, my last point is about persevering in the word. Oh, hold on, hold on. We got to review first. We got to review, right? All right, the precept, all right? We got to go into all the world and preach the gospel, okay? Why are we doing that? Because there are multitudes without God, and we need to be moved with compassion for those multitudes, okay? Because there are few laborers, all right? So we want to be among those few laborers who are preaching the gospel. But yet we got to realize, perspective-wise, not everybody's going to be saved, right? In fact, most people will not be saved. And we need to desire the promises, the promises that we will reap, right? We will have people come and be saved. And we also need to remember that, look, we're going to receive wages for this later on. God's going to reward us. Prepare for the work following Christ, right? Make sure you're reading the word of God. Don't, don't go out soul winning when you haven't even read the word for that day. You haven't prayed. You haven't done anything, right? Don't think like, oh, this is my, I'm going to like read the word by preaching these words to other people, right? You need to already be in the word of God that day. And don't be ashamed of the gospel. Be prepared to tell people of it. Praying for help, we need utterance, we need boldness, and we need it through the power of the Holy Ghost. Right? And preach the message with simplicity, right? not with man's wisdom. Okay? And deal with rejection properly, not in a fleshly way. And finally, persevering in the work. Okay? Now, I don't actually have, and maybe some verses will come to mind, but these are more just thoughts that I have for persevering in the work. Okay? Uh, my first thought is, you know, we should, make, we should try to make soul winning a habit. Okay? Now, a lot of times we have habits that we just do, not because we're thinking about it, right? But just, we just do them, okay? Now, that's not the habit that I mean. I mean we should do it on a regular basis. Because if it becomes just a, a habit of the flesh, well, we're going to do it, but we're not going to be doing it for the right reasons. We just do it because we do it, right? And there are a lot, of, a lot of people in churches will sometimes do that. You know, they've just been doing it. And, that's, and eventually, they're probably going to quit. They're not going to be consistent forever on that. So how do we, how do we have a, a habit of soul winning? Well, you know, make sure, if you can, that it, you, we go out at least every week. You know, that, I think that's a good goal for people. And, you know, a lot of people, for example, I know there's bombs in here. It's hard to go out, right? So another opportunity you can have for, for making a habit of soul winning is actually an everyday soul winning. Now, that doesn't mean that every day you're soul winning. But whenever you have that opportunity to give somebody around you, you know, because... We have different people we meet, right? I meet different people than you guys, obviously. I, mean, I don't even live here, right? You'll meet people, I meet people you'll never meet, and vice versa. So if I meet those people and I just let them go without giving them any hint of the gospel, right? Well, that's a disappointment. Where I could just, as an everyday soul winner, hand them a track, you know, hand them a YouTube card, something like that to help them to at least, even if they don't have time to listen right there, they can at least have a resource to possibly get saved later, you know? They have that opportunity. So, and that could, any of us could do that, you know? You don't, and, and like I said, I mean, even my wife, right? I mean, it's, it's hard sometimes to just go out with the baby and everything. It's hard to get that time, just, oh, baby needs to eat, baby needs to sleep. It's very difficult, right? So, also, in our soul winning, sometimes we, we get a little bit bitter and we start thinking about all the failures we've had. But that's not what we should think about. We should instead remember the successes. We should be thankful for the successes God has given us. Remember he said, if you abide in me, or what was that verse in John chapter 4? Um, Without me, you can do nothing, right? So 
if it wasn't for Christ allowing us to do all this, we, we wouldn't be going soul winning. Oh, we wouldn't be able to, right? So we need to be thankful to him for what we have been able to accomplish. And uh, also, another thing, and I think we do this already, but when we go out soul winning, when we come back, when we meet with people, talk about what you're doing, right? Don't just be like, yeah, I went out soul winning. Right? No, you got to talk about, hey, this is, we met this guy, and we were able to give this gospel, you know, yeah, he, he got saved or not. He didn't quite get saved, but let's pray for him, right? Let's pray for this guy. And that's my last point. Pray for those to whom you preach, right? Because like we read in the verse, you know, there's the sower and there's the reaper. Look, you, you might be both. You might be the sower and the reaper, but often there's a sower and then there's another reaper, okay? So let's pray that there would be somebody who would reap that person to whom you sow the precious word of God, right? So uh, let's just review the points one more time. That was my last point. This is the last review. I know you were sick of the review already, but... All right, so the first thing to being a consistent soul winner is the precept, which is preaching the gospel to every creature, right? Now, why we're doing that is because there's a problem. There are multitudes without Christ upon whom Christ wants us to have compassion. Right? Compassion, not, ah, oh, I have to go soul winning again. You know, compassion upon the actual people that we're going to talk to. And there are a few labors we need to add to those few labors. Now, having the perspective, again, that few will actually be saved. So don't get discouraged, okay? This place, this area, by the way, I will say this. Uh, Pastor Kevin was mentioning this area is going to have like a million more people in 10 years. So I think it's going to be way better soul winning. And over the, you know, if there's 100,000 new people every year, it's going to get better here, you know, than it is right now. Uh, middle class people, you know, who are going to be probably more willing to listen. So I will say that. But right now, you know, don't be discouraged when we go out and it's hard to actually see people saved sometimes, okay? And remember the promises that you will get people saved, right? It's not, it doesn't mean that every time you go out, you're going to get somebody saved. But you will get people saved if you go out with the right attitude, okay? Now, also remember that uh, you will have rewards in heaven. You'll have rewards on this earth. And you'll get to meet all those people one day. I mean, I don't even remember some of the people that I got saved. You know, I've kind of forgotten them over, over the years, right? But yet, I'll remember them one day in heaven, and I'll get to talk to them. And prepare for the work. You have this great work, let's prepare for it. Make sure you're reading the Bible. Be prepared. Make sure you're obeying his word. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Be thinking about the gospel a lot. You know, remember what Christ has done for us so that we will actually have compassion on others uh, through that thought in our mind. Pray for help because we can't do it in our own flesh. Pray for the utterance. Pray for the boldness. Pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us when we're out preaching to people. And also... Uh, do that preaching with simplicity, right? Don't put a bunch of worthless points into it. You don't have to teach about, you don't, you don't have to explain everything about reprobates, you know, to everybody. You know, that's not, yeah, that's not really the most important thing, you know, for people who aren't saved, right? And, uh, and then deal with rejection properly, okay? So don't respond in that fleshly way to people, but do rebuke people who have to be rebuked. You, know, you can't let certain things go. Rebuke those people. And persevere in the work, make that habit, focus on the successes, encourage others, and just pray for those who you've preached to. Okay, so let's close in prayer.